Welcome to this Veterinary High Performance How-To Guide. Today, How-To Equine Inguinal Close Castration. My name is Patrick Pollock and I am a Professor of Veterinary Surgery in Remote and Rural Medicine and a specialist in large animal surgery. As with all of our How-To Guides, they're designed to stimulate discussion and ideas. And if you would like some help with the cases that you're dealing with, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Equine castration is one of the most commonly performed elective surgeries in mixed and equine practice. But despite that, the reported complication rate remains stubbornly high, with some papers reporting that it is as high as 30%. If you were to go into hospital and the surgeon say to you that the complication rate for your routine elective procedure was going to affect nearly a third of patients, you'd be understandably and justifiably concerned. And so we really need to think about why that is, why the complication rate is so high, and really how we can reduce that complication rate. And the topic of this how-to guide is to give you an idea for a procedure which is commonly performed, which certainly has a much lower rate of complications as reported. You can see there the complications that we commonly see around equine castration. Some of those are trivial and mild, mild hemorrhage, right through to severe, such as eventration, where the horse's life is at risk. So is the solution a closed castration performed in the inguinal region during general anaesthesia? Before you start, you need to make sure that you've examined the horse thoroughly, that there is a full clinic examination performed, because obviously you're going to perform a general anaesthetic on this horse, and that you've given appropriate analgesia and antimicrobials, and you've checked the tetanus status of this horse and given tetanus prophylaxis if required. You need to palpate the inguinal region and the scrotum and make sure that there are two descended testicles. And you should talk to the owner about the history of this horse. Is there a history of a previous fluctuating swelling within the inguinal region, which might be indicative of an inguinal hernia, which will certainly increase the complication rate or potentially increase the complication rate. So what is uh, an inguinal castration? Well, this is an our routine technique, which is performed by making a paraingual incision overlying the external inguinal ring and using blunt dissection to expose the spermatic cord. The cord is then grasped and the testicle is exteriorized and, and pulled out of the scrotum. And there's then hemostasis performed on the cremaster and the cord. So excellent, careful hemostasis. The wound is then closed and as reported, there is a reduced risk of swelling and a reduced risk of complications. And this technique was originally described for use in older and larger stallions. So let's run through the technique. Before we get started, we're going to take some time to make sure that we don't have contamination. We're going to pack the prep use with some gauze swabs, and we're going to then use a purse string suture to close the prep use, uh, such as you can see here in the middle picture. It's really worth doing that because you don't want urine spilling into the incision during the surgery. The technique itself is incredibly straightforward. A bold incision through the, subs, the skin and subcutis uh, overlying the external inguinal ring and then um, careful blunt dissection. That's the end of anything sharp. So you put away the sharp things and really it's fingers from now on. And if you are in the right plane of dissection, what will happen here is that this tissue will open up very nicely, exposing the external inguinal ring and coming out of that, obviously, the spermatic cord. The technique once you've exposed that cord is to hook the cord with one or two fingers. So the finger hooks around the cord just as you can see it being done there. You can perforate, digitally perforate the soft tissue like that and then you're going to just use uh, pressure to pull the testicle out of the scrotum. Sometimes a little bit of help, a little bit of squeezing will allow you to pull that testicle through very nicely. We're then going to take uh, some dry gauze and use that to push away the subcutaneous tissue. We're going to digitally perforate and break the pre-scrotal ligament, as you can see there, and then using that gauze, just dissect away all of that soft tissue, which is attached onto the cremaster and onto the cord. 
The next stage is to separate the cremaster muscle, as you can see. So we're going to just make a hole between the cremaster and the uh, spermatic cord. And it's very useful at this point to have an assistant who can press their fingers against the body wall while ligatures are applied. In this case, ligatures of a monofilament absorbable material of around four metric, that's one USP, and a surgeon's knot is fine, um, just pulled in. The cremaster knot doesn't need to be too tight because oftentimes what will happen there is that the knot will, or the suture will tear through if you uh, over tighten that. Once that's been placed, as you can see, we're going to move to Cut that, and then we're going to apply a similar ligature. This is a, an important encircling ligature around the spermatic cord itself. And that's placed in the same way. Two throws on this knot. This is a surgeon's knot. Two throws at the start. And then pull into position and get those thumbs right in there, right into the base of the knot and really jerk that in position. Take some of the tension off as you do that. Your assistant can help you just making sure you've really seated that ligature extremely well. It's not a transfixation ligature. It's an encircling ligature. And the reason for that is that if this tears um, and it's a transfixation ligature, there's a greater risk that it will stay with the uh, spermatic cord and the vessels will move elsewhere. And then we're going to cut that. Our next step is going to be the use of um, the emasculator. We're just going to put a clamp on the cord below so that we've got a hold of it in case it disappears. And we're going to bring in our emasculator. And we're first of all going to emasculate the cremaster muscle. That's going to be about a centimeter above where the ligature was placed. And we're going to hold that in place for, um, <clears throat> it doesn't need to be on for a particularly long time. And then we're going to do something similar with the cord itself. So that's held in place. A little word about emasculators. Clearly, emasculators need to be well maintained. You should check them before you apply them on. They're applied traditionally nut to nut, so the nut on the emasculator of the testicle itself. But what that means is that the cutting portion is near the testicle and the crushing portion is near or the body wall. And you can see this is a Sarah emasculator. It's got a clamp or a ratchet on it and that holds it in position so that it's not going to, to come away and not allow you to go and do other things. And that is the procedure.
So just to run through some of those things again, just to emphasize what we're doing, we're going to emasculate having placed a ligature, both the cremaster muscle individually, and we're going to emasculate the cord. And when we do that, we're going to go about a finger's breadth, a centimeter above where the ligature has been placed and that's going to give us excellent hemostasis. And we're going to leave the emasculator in place for a minimum of one minute on the spermatic cord and maybe a little bit longer. It used to be traditionally said a minute for every year of the horse's life. But of course, if you get a, an older stallion, then that's not going to be really practical. So at least two minutes really is, is usually what I would opt for. The ligation and emasculation, um, the cremaster muscle and tunic are, are, are ligated individually and as I mentioned, four metric number one USP monofilament absorbable suture material works well. Polydioxanon, PDS, is a really good option. The emasculator is applied approximately one centimetre from the ligature on the testicle side of the ligature and we always check our emasculator prior to use. Couple of little tips and tricks which make a big difference. Um, one is to put some local anaesthetic into the body of the testicle, five to 10 mils, depending on the size of the testicle, draw back before you do that. And that obviously will help whoever is doing the anaesthesia for you. Uh, you may be doing the anaesthesia yourself, so that will just reduce um, the amount of stimulation that's coming. And don't forget to grasp that cord as I did with the Alice tissue forceps um, before you do your emasculation. And then at the end, you can uh, have a good look, let go of it, take the tension off it and drop it back and make sure that you've got no blood um, coming up, welling up from the incision. The wound is closed in, in two or three layers. Intradermal sutures work really well in the skin. Um, and then of course, at the end of the procedure, you're going to uh, remove the prepucial suture and gauze. These animals are treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for five to seven days. And don't forget that there can be some spermatozoa in the tubules. And so restricting exposure to mares for four to six weeks as recommended uh, is the best thing to do. These animals are best outside, they're best at pasture. Um, they don't want to be standing in swelling up. If they have to be inside, then they should be walked out two or three times a day and you could consider some cold hosing. What to expect afterwards? Well, here's a one that was done um, just a couple of days ago. You can see there's a little bit of a seroma in the um, scrotal sac, but there is limited, almost no swelling around the incisions. These wounds uh, heal with few complications uh, and they can be managed as a standard castration. So that's inguinal castration, something that I think could certainly reduce the risk of complications in these types of animals. As always, the information presented here is for illustrative purposes and is based on our views and opinions only and not the opinions of anyone we may work or have worked with uh, for any context in the past. The series is not intended to provide direct veterinary advice to individual cases. And if you're faced with an injured animal, you should seek the advice of a veterinary professional in your jurisdiction. If you've enjoyed the material presented here or any of the other videos on the Veterinary High Performance YouTube site, please consider sharing this on your network or subscribing to Veterinary High Performance or giving us a like. Thanks for your time.